Hi, good evening. Welcome to another Royal My Whiskies online tasting. Um, I hope everyone is able to see this live or possibly you're watching the rerun uh, in the future. Um, in which case, people of the future, hopefully it all works out okay. There seems to be some doubts whether the future is going to be all right, but um, hopefully it is. Um, so tonight, today, we are doing independent bottlings. So independent bottlers. We've got three very fine independent bottlers, two drams each. Quite a lot to get through. But I think before we start, it's probably worth giving a little summary of what independent bottling is is really what is an independent bottler well simply put it is a whiskey company that bottles uh, normally a single malt whiskey that they don't own or the distillery they don't own basically so why would uh, a distillery owner allow someone to do this and lose control of price or brand or quality um uh, and it's quite an interesting point just to have a little think about before we start and i'm thinking about maybe people who are relatively new to whiskey. Um, so you've got to think about how the industry is structured, first of all, which is largely around um, the blend, blended whiskey. So um, if you look at Diageo, for example, they own 28 malt distilleries. They are the largest whiskey company in Scotland. They have Johnny Walker as their uh, primary blend, their primary brand, but even they owning 28 malt whiskey distilleries, they use upwards of 40 whiskies is often the, the, the number you hear. So even they don't have all the whiskies, the components that they need to make up Johnny Walker. So they need to trade, they need to use whiskey from some of their competitors. It's an unusual thing about uh, the Scotch whiskey industry that your competitors may also be your suppliers or your customers. <clears throat> so there exists this, uh, this uh, pool of stock that is traded often through uh, an intermediary, a, a third party, a broker, um, to allow people to swap and trade to make up shortfall or to offload surplus. Because, of course, you have um, this inherent problem of Scotch whiskey that you have to try and predict what you're going to sell <clears throat> in six years time, eight years time, 10 years time. So um, there, there needs to be this outlet to trade stock and independent bottlers and this, this um, small offshoot of the industry uh, are able to feed off this pool of stock and find interesting, excellent parcels of whiskey that they then uh, select and bottle um, as single malts under their own brand, naming the distillery. So um, even uh, uh, a big brand like McAllen or Beaumont, you may find bottled by another uh, company. But it's not a knockoff. Uh, independent bottling uh, has a very valued role within the industry to whiskey geeks like myself or whiskey retailers like myself. Um, they offer variation. Um, they shine a light on distilleries that maybe the big companies uh, don't have the time or the resources or the route to market to um, to market and sell. Um, furthermore, you know it's it's fairly well agreed that um, some of the very finest examples of big famous distilleries have been bottled by uh, independent bottlers. Um, some not so good ones as well. There is there there is a huge variation of quality, but we've got some very good independent bottlers tonight who take great care in their selections, and I'm sure we'll find some absolute gems tonight. I've had a quick tram, so uh, I've had a quick go at the smell of all of them, and I know there's some beauties in there for sure. So I suppose we're saying it's probably worth setting out um, your your six glasses. Hopefully you've got six different glasses. If you're relatively uh, new to drinking whiskey, I would, I would recommend having individual glasses. And I would recommend not finishing each dram as you go, but leaving a little bit in, in each of the glasses so you can go back and see how they develop, how they change over time. And with the addition of water, which you'll probably need some water because we've got some fairly strong uh, drams here, uh, natural cast strength. Uh, most of them are natural cask strength. Uh, that's another excellent thing about independent bottling. There is very much a theme of 
bottling, unchill filtered, slightly higher strength, natural color, very often cast strength, which is um, uh, which is something that a great many whiskey fans appreciate and is not always done by the by the bigger companies. Um, so that's one little bit of housekeeping. Water, six glasses. Um, the system that we have allows you to leave comments, uh, which I can bring up on screen um, as we go along. We've actually got quite a lot to get to through in terms of drams. I'll kind of try and do maybe 10 minutes a dram probably. So we may not get a chance to get to all the questions. So uh, maybe leave those slightly more towards the end, but feel free to comment. Um, your, your interactions are still, are still welcomed. Um, in terms of selling the whiskey, all the whiskies will be available for sale as soon as we kind of end the broadcast, basically. So you can relax. You don't have to rush around if you find something you really love and try and try and buy it in the middle of the tasting. It will be available on all my whiskies at the end of the tasting. Uh, as we go along, we'll, we'll put all the basic nuts and bolts, the details of the whiskies as we go up, and we'll have a, a, a summary price list at the end as well. I'll just pop up before I introduce our first person, which is Greg. I just wanted to put up the order of drams again, um, just so you can see it. it. It has been sitting on the screen for a while, so you've probably got it. Uh, sorry, I'm just scrolling through. Here we go. Yeah, so we're going to start with the Linkwood, then we'll have the Canvas, the Longmorn, the Beaumont, the Ben Nevis, and then the Whiskey Row, uh, Smoke and Pleat Peat, which is uh, a blended whiskey. Um, so I think that's all I need, wanted to introduce. Uh, did I introduce myself? My name's Arthur. Hiya. Um, so let's start with the Linkwood. So I'll just pop the details up there. Um, so uh, that is not the Linkwood. Excuse me. Well, that's the Linkwood. There we go. Um, so Linkwood 1997, uh, a rare find from a company called Cleanne Moore. Um, so let's introduce Greg. Um, hi, Greg. How are you doing? Hi there. How are you? I'm good, Arthur. Yeah, very well. So, um, so yeah, we've got the link. But I, I guess throughout the tasting, we'll probably give people a bit of time to nose and taste the whiskey. Uh, so um, yeah. we'll kind of sum it up at the end, I guess. Okay. Um, and because it takes a little while for you to get used to the whiskey for it to develop into the glass. But I suppose um, we can start talking about uh, Leanne Moore and Rare Find and, and your company. I, I'm, I I'm re would really like you to just to mention the, the great job you've done with, um, with the hand sanitizer recently. Tell us about that. Yeah, um, a lot of people have been asking about that. So, and, and we're not the only people doing it now, thankfully, because at the start it did seem like there was a lot of pressure on us to get as much out as possible. We were lucky once once kind of things started progressing quite quickly at the start of lockdown, we, we were sitting with quite a lot of neutral rain spirit in house at the time. Um, this is for your we were, gin production, is it? Yeah, yeah. So we were we were only really missing a few components to make the World Health Organization recipe for the sanitizer that, that's approved by them. So yeah, we, we sourced the other things that were needed from kind of local sources and started putting out as quick as we could within a couple of days, really. The hardest bit was just making sure that kind of logistically how to get it to people safely. And um, obviously at first we, we had great intentions of getting it to as many households as possible, but to, to have uh, thousands of bottles going to individual doors, it became difficult. So the local police helped get it into the right people's hands, local chemists. And um, we supplied pretty much uh, all the emergency services in that kind of first couple of weeks, um, helping them out as well to make sure they were safe. And yeah, it just it kind of grew arms and legs. And thankfully, more people got involved in it and kind of plugged the gap. Um, yeah. Well, we we really appreciated it. We we had to keep our warehouse going. Uh, well, we wanted to keep our warehouse going, and then we also opened our brunch or drink manga shop as well. And it yeah. was impossible to get and you know to keep our staff feeling safe. And, um, and able to serve and able to trade. It was really valuable. So thank you so much. Um, it was really kind no of problem. to give us that. So, um, so yeah, Gliam or Rare Find, um, you're relatively new to independent bottling. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, five years the, the, the company's been going. Um, Rare Find was the, the first kind of brand to come out under the, the Gliam Moore um, brand. Uh, but now we've obviously, we're, we're known for our gins as well. We've got a few gin brands in there. Um, we've got our a, 
I've got a, we've got a couple of other things going on as well, which will I'll, I'll come come to the front uh, in the next few months to the next year. But yeah, at the moment um, we're, we're sitting with quite a few brands within the umbrella of the company. Um, it's quite a flexible portfolio, which is great for us. We get to see a lot of great spirit and we get to experiment a lot with with lots of different flavor profiles and um, even right down to some of the casts that we use from the rare find goes into our fucking gin for the cask resting of the gin and stuff. So there's a lot of kind of crossover and stuff between the brands as well. So that's your whiskey cask aged in firkin. Yeah, so yeah, um, the, the firkin gins had a few different expressions over the years. Um, we're, we're known for our American oak was was the original, but we've got an Isla expression. We've got a red wine finish. We've got a white wine finish. So yeah, there's a few different variants in there. And then the, the base spirit's now available as well. And so that people can see the quality of the gin that we start with before it actually goes into the casks and all the all the rest of the casks is done in the warehouse in Leith as well. So it's it's yeah, a good product to kind of okay. showcase to to the gin market, especially who don't really see the influence that wood has on our spirit. It's great to show them the lineup of gins in front of them. And, and from the red wine to the Isla, it's, it's completely different ends of the spectrum in terms of flavour profile, but it's the same starting point. And it's a good <clears throat> visual and a sensory way to get across to people what oak does to the spirit. Obviously, whiskey drinkers understand. Yeah. Predominantly. Well, <clears throat> let's get off, Jim. We'll get a pelter so we spend too much yeah. time talking about it. <laughs> but, I mean, I suppose uh, independent bottling is about access to stock. And I, I, I know Derek, I mean, he just came into the industry and he's, he's managed to get some really interesting things coming through as well. And you've shown yeah. me some of the stock list and, and you've, you've got some things in the arsenal <coughs> that are going to uh, going to impress people uh, for sure. And so talking about this liquid, I mean, I, I think in the introduction, I mentioned something about shining a light on a, on a distillery that is not so often bottled a single malt. It's owned by Diageo. It's um, there's a, a lovely 12 year old floral fauna, um, but on the whole it exists to, to serve um, Johnny Walker and be an ingredient into that. But this mm-hmm. is a port cask, yes? Yes, so it's uh, two years in, in port finished. Um, as you say, uh, Johnny Walker, White Horse and blends like that would usually get the bulk of the linkwood stock. So it is, it is one that you don't maybe see on the indie market. There has been a few over the years that pop up now and again, but they are few and far between. Um, so, yeah, we just thought it's something a bit different. And did you say you bought this as a port cask finish? So you, you didn't finish uh, it yourselves? No, no, it, it came it came already finished, um, yeah. That's well, quite unusual that, that, yeah. that a Finnish whiskey would be out there in the market, but yeah. you're definitely getting what I'm getting, these uh, that kind of red berry. Uh, yeah. What did I write here? Uh, three freeze-dried strawberries, like you get in that kind of yeah, cereal. Yeah. You know that cereal. Um, you know, <laughs> blue, blueberries, yeah. things like that. Yeah. What, what are you getting? Yeah, I, I find it's it's quite fruity on the nose, but once you start getting into the palate, there's a inherent kind of bitterness there that I think is, is quite well associated with liquid. Um, it's a little bit peppery on the finish as well once you get there. But yeah, it's, it, as you say, the, those red fruits really come through, which is a common thing, obviously, with the pork finish whiskies. Mm. Yeah, very good. And so a little later, we'll come back. Uh, to you, Greg, and we'll, we'll try mm-hmm. some of your, your your PT stuff and talk about Leith, which is which is where you're based. Um, yep. Uh, so there's there's lots to talk about there, but I'm gonna bring in Graham if that's all right. But that's a that's absolutely a really dram that liquid is a really great way to start. I was swithering about whether to start with a liquid or start with a canvas. Naturally, you'd think a grain, but it's just got this light, elegant, uh, fruity style. It's a really nice yep. way to start a tasting, whereas this canvas has a bit of sherry cask influence. So I left that for a second. So um, I'll say goodbye for now, Greg. We'll, we'll bring you back in later on. Um, Super. And there we go. There's Graham. Hi, Graham. Hi, Arthur. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing good. So... Uh, We've got the canvas to go now. So those are the details. If you want to start nosing it, we'd, we'll uh, we'll probably want to mention that strength straight away, 60.6. So it's going to take a bit of water for sure. Uh, good age, 27 years old, from a sherry butt. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to try this properly. Mm-hmm. Uh, close, a closed distillery, obviously. But um, before we come on to canvas, um, I'd be 
uh, interested to hear a little bit about Morris Mackay, the fact you are not just independent bottlers, you are also uh, distillers. Yeah, correct. So um, Morrison Mackay is the, um, I guess, the, the co-founder's names. Um, so a lot of people, I will, I will freely admit, maybe haven't necessarily heard of Morrison and Mackay, but a lot of people will probably have encountered some of our brands like Carnmore or Old Perth or um, some of the other stables that we have. And yeah, basically the it was about 15 years ago, um, the, the Morrison family, you would know um, as the Morrison Beaumore Distillers um, family, and they, they descend from the legendary Stanley P. Morrison. Um, and he was obviously um, a, a big figure in the industry. He purchased Beaumore on Isla, Auchintosh in near Glasgow, and Glengarry up near Aberdeen. And um, they owned them for quite some time. They, they turned it into one of the largest distilling companies in the world at the time um, and then eventually that got sold off to Suntory and what became Beam Suntory and um, it was a good opportunity for the guys to go you know from a large global company back to grassroots and, and to really get their hands dirty again with uh, actually making whiskey and distributing it um, on the smaller scale. So that was about 15 years ago now that we actually went into operation initially in the Scottish Liqueur Centre in Bankfoot, just beside the A9. And um, so it was, it was Brian Morrison, who was Stanley's son. His brother, Tim, is actually the one who's set up AD Rattray. So they've got a nice little sibling connection in the industry there. And then the Mackay was not myself. I should make clear, I am simply a Mackay, not one of the Mackays. Right. Um, illegitimate son, if you will. Um, still a great Mackay. You're a great Mackay. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank <laughs> you very much. <laughs> and um, so Kenny Mackay was the the other co-founder on our original MD, and he worked at Morrison Bowmore for a long time. Um, and originally at Peter Thompson's in in Perth, where we're based, at quite a famous blender um, of the day. So yes, yeah, in a, in a long long roundabout way, I'm essentially saying that they know what they're doing. You know the the, the family. Um, I've got a lot of generations of whiskey experience mm -hmm. and now that's kind of culminated in we, we moved to this new site in Aberargy where you've been out to, to see us and um, beautiful purpose-built facility um, that's it there it's just uh, about 10 miles south of Edin of Perth sorry on the way to Edinburgh um, this is actually on the road to Lindor's Abbey and this is literally just a a video from the roadside you uh, you'd be able to see these pictures if you drive by so quite a large facility um a working site um these were our, our some of our original casks which were filled and um, we're lucky enough to actually own the majority of the barley fields um from around the area and from uh, further afield um, so that's actually a picture i took of the first uh, barley harvest when we first got up and running um, and we were lucky enough to essentially not not at the beginning I should say but now we're up to 100% of the the barley um, we malt through Simpsons and then it comes back to us and we distill it and we're actually using golden promise barley which is quite nice to um, kind of bring back into the limelight you know yeah great that's really exciting and I, I don't know and I, and I respect you guys for it that you you kind of don't want to talk too much about Ab Abaragi at the moment because you've got no real plans to bottle it uh yet and uh, sure. and you're kind of not ready to talk about it yet but yeah so, well, yeah one of the impressive things i think about you guys actually and it's not the most glamorous picture but that's your bottling line isn't it it is indeed yeah it's yeah, uh, cool. a brand new italian bottling line that was uh, installed um just three years ago there so yeah, that's great. I mean, just that you've got that control over bottling as well, whereas mm -hmm. a lot of um, independent bottlers have to contract. Um, yeah, I think it's worth uh, worth noting. I think you you may well agree. I think um, from the outside looking in, you might be surprised when you actually come to our site and realise the the scale of it. You know, the amount of casks we've got in storage, and the amount of control we do from kind of start to finish. You know, so it's it's a nice place to work. I must admit. 
Yeah. So uh, we should start talking about the whiskey in the glass a little bit because there's actually quite a lot to talk about this one because it's yeah. different. It is canvas. It is uh, a single grain uh, whiskey. It's from a closed distillery. It's from a, uh, a distillery which played a key role in the development of the history of the whiskey industry, which you can maybe come on to. But mm -hmm. I suppose for people who don't know, we should just talk a little bit about the difference between grain and malt. Yeah. So. I guess, you know, I know we're, we're both aware that there's plenty industry folk tuning in tonight and there's plenty uh, whiskey geeks and, and I can't, we count ourselves in that bracket, that's a positive term, um, but we are also well aware we don't want to leave anyone behind and we don't want to go too highbrow too, too quickly, so we will explain things throughout the night as we, as we go along where it needs to be. So, so I guess very simply, um, the other five we're trying tonight are malt whiskey, so they're 100% malted barley as their ingredients. And then very crucially, they're made using a, a pot still, um, which I'm sure we all know what they look like. So you've got two pots like still that. there. <laughs> and that's a typical setup, um, you know, essentially a giant kettle. Um, but, but the crucial difference being that a pot still is a single use still. So essentially you can load it up, you can fire it up, you can produce your alcohol, and then you need to clean it out and recharge it. And so essentially, they're not the most efficient um, pieces of equipment. And then if you go to a grain whiskey, you're going to use a column still, which is also known as a continuous still, a coffee still, a patent still. It's, it's got all sorts of names. But the real key difference to hone in on is single distillation versus continuous distillation, I guess. Um, so that's a typical kind of two column um, still. And without getting into the the pretty technical science behind it it's a really efficient way of making higher proof alcohol than you can make on a on a pot still um and i, I guess to put it in context a lot of people don't necessarily appreciate the size of these things um and i always used to talk about bacardi as a, as a distillery it's the largest rum distillery in the world in in puerto rico and they've got five of these column setups there and they can run these things 24 hours a day for, for months on end, if, if you want, but without too much maintenance. And basically in Bacardi, they can produce 100,000 litres of alcohol in 24 hours. Um, so it's a huge amount. Um, you know, that's comparable to, I guess, Ballandalic Distillery and Nicanean Distillery. I think they're two new ones that are roughly 100,000. For, for comparison's sake, Aberargi is actually about 750,000 if it was going full whack on, on two shifts. It's not... Uh, producing that but you know Bacardi with five column stills could produce the yearly output of Aberargi in, in seven days if they wanted to so yeah or, or to use a more famous one you know in a week and a half you can do all the spring bank that's made in a year basically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's it's something that clearly changed the the industry overnight and it's um it's maybe where we've ended up with this sort of maligned thought towards grain um so so if you mix grain and malt together you obviously get a blended whiskey and grain whiskey distilleries are are huge you know they, these can be um over 100 million liters in capacity per per year if, if you want to go to the really big guys like cameron bridge um and i guess the efficiency and the size and scale of these things maybe leads to this kind of maligned um, opinion that maybe they're cheaper and they're not quite as, as good quality but I think it's nice for us to be able to release these single grains. Um, well, and, they and are it. certainly cheaper to make. I would agree. <laughs> yeah, but, but um, it, it's a lovely style in itself. Um, uh, and um, and this one, it certainly is. And I've also kind of... Yeah, you know... Kind of honey cereal character, pastries. Yeah, um, I was writing a lot of things like brioche and, and custard tart and... Um, you know, you sometimes get a little bit of polish on, on grain whiskey, sort of furniture polish. No, I don't think there was too much of that creeping in. It's not necessarily unpleasant. Um, and obviously the higher ABV, um, the 60.6 .6 is there because it's distilled to a slightly higher strength. For me, if you've not tried a lot of grain whiskey, a good way to kind of calibrate your, your thoughts, and this is the old canvas distillery, I believe. Is that right, Arthur? Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. I think that's from Barnard. Oh, oh yeah, Barnard's, Barnard's famous book. So, um, so yeah, I think for me, it's it's kind of a good bridge between American whiskey, bourbon, and, and rye and things, and and Scotch malt whiskey, 
um, it's made in, from similar ingredients often. You know, I think typically in Scotland, we used corn for a, a long time. Um, canvas, I would be pretty certain, would, would have been corn up until it closed. Yeah, I would have thought maize, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And then I, I'd really like, if you could indulge me, I'd love to talk a little bit about canvas's history in terms of what I said about it playing an integral role in the development of the industry. It was a, yeah. real, a real turning point. So it was a malt distillery. Then it, um, uh, column stills um, were um, were installed um, by Mowbray. I think it was a John Mowbray, and then he had a son, and then a, uh, another son, I think, that ran it as well. Um, but it, once you get up until... Uh, up to 1877, it was one of the founding partners of DCL, the Distillers Company, um, which through various evolutions becomes Diageo. But the crucial part in terms of history is its role in the what is whiskey debate. Um, yeah. So this was a very prominent uh, uh, public discussion about whether grain whiskey could be called whiskey at all. And it was a bit of a ding dong um, with uh, Cambus actually playing a key role. And there was a chap, William Ross, who was uh, one of the first directors, I think, at DCL. And, um, and they actually, he actually used Cambus um, as a kind of poster boy for grain, sold as a seven-year-old, when this was becoming a prominent discussion and there was clearly going to be a decision made at, at government level about whether or not grain could be called whiskey at all. And there was a, there was a lobbying from certain uh, single malt or pot distillers, uh, particularly, I think, McKenzie, up at Dalmore, but a few others who said this is the real whiskey and this grain whiskey stuff should not be called um, whiskey at all. And yeah. Canvas, I've got a pick, I've got a copy of the advert. Have you ever seen it, Graham? Um, yeah, there's a famous um, gallon, not a gallon and a headache. There you go. So this was in the Daily Mail in 1906, I think. Um, unfortunately, there's a few different versions, but you can see just above the, the gentleman's head, not a gallon in, uh, not a headache in a gallon. And That's also right, yeah. very, yeah, very boldly status. Canvas is not a pot still whiskey. So just <laughs> at the point where people were saying this grain stuff you couldn't call whiskey, they were, they were actually different, proudly differentiating themselves. Anyway, yeah. the, I suppose the end result is that they, that, you know, DCL and others, the grain distillers, did win that. I think it was a 1908 commission, and there was a, uh, a famous case in the borough of Islington where um, where uh, a couple of retailers were, were prosecuted for selling whiskey not of a, a fit quality, which effectively had large quantities of grain whiskey in it that kind of sparked off this debate. But it was very well discussed in um, in newspapers and was, was um, something that many, many people in the UK would have known about. I've got yeah, a few other guys. Oh, yeah, Sorry, I think that's an important distinction, isn't it? It's not just um, industry folk it was aimed at. This was a, a large-scale campaign. Yeah, I think it's a shame, actually, the canvas is gone. It's a closed distillery shut in '93. Uh, it has its site is used as a cooperage and um, cast filling stores and things like that. But it's mm -hmm. one of the things about grey whiskey is maybe it doesn't capture the imagination quite as much as single malt distilleries. There aren't quite as many stories. They just kind of chunter away making yeah. whiskey uh, but canvas is one that did have that story and it's it's i think canvas in in the gordon are probably my two favorites uh here's an old um so this oh, wow. yeah this is uh, in fact there's two um so this would be when uh, in those days well maybe even still now i wouldn't know but um you had to declare what you were about to do basically to the customs officer um and uh, this is basically a declaration that they're just about to mash, I think. Uh, yes. Um, and that's actually from 1837. So pretty much the first year of distillation. That's um, amazing, isn't it? Uh, that's uh, well, cool. you see various dates of when uh, when it starts. Yeah. Um, there was one other thing I feel like I had with Canvas. Well, we can maybe come back to this at the end because I don't want to take up too much time talking about it. But a, a, sure. a dear friend of mine, has lent me this amazing document, which um, I need more time to go through because it's incredibly fragile. Oh my goodness, 
Hey, check that out. <laughs> Look that is, uh, a living piece of history, eh? You got to be careful. Yeah. With that. No, it's it's if you just look at the if you look at the binding, it's um, wow. <laughs> but it's uh, it's basically it's it's a what do you call it a ledger? I'm, I'm not sure, but it's basically a record of every major architectural change from 1871 at the distillery right through until early 1910, 1915. Oh wow, fantastic! It, span, it spans that time where it came into. Um, uh, <laughs> came into and it's all handwritten as well look at that anyway um, and it didn't disintegrate so you're you're allowed to uh, continue on yeah well i'm terrified to even touch it and <laughs> but i have had a good look through it but um but yeah so anyway sum up thoughts on the canvas then what do you what, what do you think about it why, why why do you choose to bottle this one um yeah so i mean for me canvas is is one of these for, I, I kind of imagine these as a forgotten snapshot whiskey without getting too romantic on them. You know, there there is something beautiful about drinking a whiskey which will no longer be replicated. And um, in particular, I love a single cask, cask strength bottle. It's about as close an experience as you can get to coming to the warehouse and trying it out of the cask. You know, it's just quite a classic armchair style of dram. Good one to take your, your time over. But I think it's... Um, had a good amount of time in the cask. Hopefully the sherry hasn't dominated it, hasn't taken over the spirit. It's all about balance between distillate and uh, the maturation there. Um, yeah, I, I, I put it after the, the liquid just from having a very quick nose and taste because I, I did feel, you could feel the sherry cask coming through on the finish, which gave, yeah. gave it that kind of extra weight. Um, uh, so I wanted to put it kind of second. But you're right, it's, it's absolutely not dominated by yeah. the spirit. It must be a refill. Yes, yeah, it will be for sure, or it would be uh, black as the night, I think. So, yeah, we're really happy with it. You know, it's and one thing, although we were sort of laughing about it is clearly cheaper to make. Well, for the the, the whiskey drinker, it's a lot cheaper to purchase grain whiskey too. So, so there is a lot of value to be had in these well aged grains and, and even closed distilleries. So, yeah, we can really yeah. in price still and. Uh, Absolutely. You know, I haven't got the price in my head, but I do remember thinking, God, that's a good price for a, an old close distillery for sure. Yeah, we do aim to have drinking whiskey, you know, whiskey that you're not scared to crack open and, and get stuck into. Great. So um, we probably should crack on. I think we're going to go to Ian next. Thanks very much, Graham. No problem. Um, we'll see you soon. And so Ian is going to be the Longmore. Um, so uh, we're moving on to North Star, and I will bring Mr. Croucher in. Say goodbye to Graham. Uh, hi, Ian. Hi, Arthur. How, How are you? Not bad, thank you. I am all right, thank you. Yeah, yeah. you look like you're dozing off. To... <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> it's late. No, um. Ah, uh, yeah, no, really well, and thank you for having us. And oh, it's thank a real pleasure. You for if there's anybody watching, I'm not sure, but thank you for spending your night with us. So, oh, there's lots of people watching to and... some of our drums. Yeah, there's comments coming through. I'm sure you're about to get some snarky comments uh, from your pals. Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so, tell us a bit about North Star. Uh, okay, so uh, North Star Spirits Limited, uh, I started in March 2016. Um, basically, what we are is what you kind of skimmed over earlier is independent bottlers. We buy casks from different distilleries, different producers, and that one cask, we put it into bottles, and then we label it, and on that label, we're hugely transparent as to what is in the cask, where it was distilled, uh, the unique tasting notes for each individual cask. And then after that looks really attractive as possible, we um, put it into boxes and myself and Kira, we go out uh, and we um, peddle them. We, we sell them to our importers around the world. We sell them to our wonderful UK retailers like yourself, and um, and then we get to, to to spend our evenings chatting about them. So 
in a nutshell, that's what it is. But the the, the label's very important to me. Uh, it's it was a fantastic process designing that label because I knew that the whatever spirit I cho choose to bottle is going to be fantastic. And it's easy for me to say that because I didn't make any of this. So on the label, I need to be as transparent as possible. Uh, and I think that, that, that honesty and that clarity is, is, is what makes North Star slightly, uh, well, great to work at. Uh, when your labels came on the scene as well, that we should probably start talking about whiskey soon, but you yours seemed a bit more contemporary as well, part of a slightly more modern approach to, to independent bottling. And, and you start to see even more crazy and imaginative labels coming through as well, like Thompson Brothers or Whiskey Agency or things like that as well. But it was quite a modern, fresh, bold presentation, uh, great colours. I haven't got any pictures of labels here, but... Um, but uh, yeah, good job on that. It, 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 it's it, it's more than just that independent bottling model of here's the name of the brand, here's the name of the distillery, number of bottles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a very nice design to it. But I think the whiskey that we got today, the Longbourn, um, right now, this was one that was like, wow, okay. When you see a new yeah. independent list coming through, Longmorn, two thousand five. First fill Oloroso Sherry Butt, you would think, um, and uh, also a, a whacking great big strength, 63.3%. I was like, got to try that. I was delighted when he mm. suggested it for the tasting. You must have been excited when you found it. Yeah, yeah, really excited. But just to kind of go back a step, the label uh, is, well, we took the, um, before we talk about the whiskies, which is why we're here, but I, I'm just so delighted at the label that we, we, we took a, um, Pocket Rocket, these guys up in Stirling, we worked together and we took our influence from an array, or an, uh, like a, it's uh, like a mechanical uh, thing that looks, you know, is the universe. You know, it's all clockwork and it looks beautiful. It looks like a, a Swiss watch. And that, uh, well, well, was the start of everything. That was when, when you know, you know, we thought that is... Uh, Sorry, I'm just I'm losing my train here. <laughs> just drink the whiskey, well, you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so like a true navigational tool, you know, that's always pointing north, and it's always was a was a great start. I mean, I, I, to to repeat, I don't have anything to do with the, the quality of this whiskey. So uh, the label, I had to make sure I, I I did everything that I within my skill set I could I could I could stand out slightly. So to well to talk about the Longmorn, um, I mean Longmorn is a one of my favourite favourite distillers. It, you wouldn't if you were in the marketing team at Longmorn, they would tell you it's the Scotland's best kept secret. It's not hugely uh, out there. It's not a, a mass. Most of its spirit goes into I suppose um, blends like Royal. Salute and Shivas. Uh, this one is 100% matured in uh, Oloroso Sherry Butt. Now, Longmorn to me uh, and to many people, um, it's true, I mean, it, it's sweet spot is its teenage years. Uh, 15, but you might remember the old 15 year old uh, original oh. bottling that was stunning they then changed it into the 16 and it kind of it well it maybe to some people might have lost its way when a whiskey of this robust spicy fruitiness uh the, the, the spirit that you're dealing with at the beginning and you put it into sherry wood it's something that you have to look at you have to keep going back because some really super active uh, sherry casks, you know, your ready can your whiskey can be ready at eight years old, nine years old. So this Longmorn, spicy, fruity, like beautiful character mixed with this Spanish oak and Spanish oloroso, it's just it, it is one of my most proudest casks that I've bought, and I'm just delighted that. 
somebody 15 years ago, a lot more talented than I am, managed to distill this and chose that cast to put in it for it to wait for me to come along and be able to, to bottle it. Um, my, my, my German importer uh, from uh, Jens from Sansibar, he has tried this and I really trust and respect his, uh, his nose and his talents and, you, you know, his, and he said, this is like an old uh, Samaroli bottling. Now, That's a good compliment, I mean, yeah. that is, that is a fantastic compliment. And easy for me to bum this up because I didn't make it. Yeah, but, sure, uh, sure. So absolutely. I chose to, to but do it to, um, to Coming back to what you said, and I, I, I come back to what you said there. I left, uh, I've just left the, these old Longmorn labels up on the, on, on the screen there. Oh, yeah. So what top, top left is, um, the oldest and then going clockwise to the newest, although sometimes they reverse things and mirror it, don't they? Anyway, um, uh, that Longmorn bottom left, Longmorn 15 year old, Neil Dark label. Mm. Was that the last time we really truly had a great official Longmorn bottling? I mean, some of the, and I think that's the role that independent bottlers play in people like you finding a cast like this and making it available at the moment we've got long one distiller's choice and then what 16 and 23 year old where you're starting to ask really big money for those mm. big big money for those and you know particularly it's owned by perno they just don't get enough whiskey into our hands and um and that that would be a real shame if independent bottlers weren't able to release whiskies like this because there are Longmorn fans, and I'm one of them, but I forget about the distillery sometimes because there's so little of it out there, and it feels needless that there is yeah. so little Longmorn in the world, so so little, so few different editions of Longmorn to try. And thank God for the independent bottlers and the ones that they do find. And there's a few distilleries yeah. like that. Yeah, well, I think Longmorn is one of the whiskies that shines in a single cask uh, rather than being blended Longmorn into being a brand. And in, in, in my humble opinion, I think Longmorn is fantastic. It is top drawer. You know, it's, and to, to, to experience this in a single cast that's been put in really intelligent, active wood is, um, it is I mean, amazing in my, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, I can't wait to, I, I'm delivering this to you on Friday and I can't wait you know, to for you to get it out there and um, just to see people's reactions and see what if, if people feel the same as I do about it. I yeah, I mean, so. I, I, I really I've like written it. down here like dark muscovado sugar, sugar. Um, it's like an upside down fruit sponge cake or something that's been slightly mm. overcooked almost in a way, like crumble, mm. apple crumble. Second night, you cook, but the second night you cook it, so it's got all that caramelized sugar on it, and it's still the fruits really uh, cooked down. I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm searching yeah, yeah, for yeah. it. Uh, the, the girl, uh, the lady that is our brand uh, manager, uh, she came up with some fantastic tasting notes for the long morning. I've got it in front of me um, flat coke and vanilla ice cream sizzling mm. on hot, hot tarmac. Uh, I thought that kind of nails it for me as well. That uh, that's that's going on the label. Um, a well polished cigar box and honeysuckle. I, I mean, the, the, the sherry has just. Some people might say like, "Oh, there's sweet sherry notes coming through." I mean, sweet and oloroso is not something that is really allowed to be said. It's certainly, it's banned in Spain to to say that because if it's sweet and it's oloroso, it's it's been sweetened because oloroso is quite dry but as i said the the fruitiness of that new spirit coming into this in touch with this wood for 15 years for me i'm i'm sorry it's just it is certainly one of my most favorite and i'm delighted that it is a but uh, a but which means its yield is you know massive i th i think there was there's maybe over 500 bottles we got from this uh, from this, but, and it's 63, 63 point something percent. I mean, that is a, a, a pretty, that's a big ask for somebody to enjoy that. I mean, after you have tried it, a little bit of water, obviously we'll open it up, but, uh, just please enjoy it. And I, I really hope 
you know you do and your customers yeah no there's a little doubt of that um the uh i think you have to pay a bit more for this car so didn't you it's uh it's not cheap but i think it's worth every penny yeah no 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 it wasn't one of the, the cheaper ones that I, i've purchased and but when you're as excited about it as i am i'm quite happy to you know just to get it out there make a, a, a lot of a, a less margin on it and just so it's commercial commercially it's possible but it you know you're not um really sometimes whiskeys that you're so passionate about you're not making any money on it you just want to get it out there and you're humbled and delighted you're allowed to put your own label and stamp on it almost like you kind of feel that you've you are are part of this process you know and uh, so this one i'm i'm excited about them all uh but this one's like special yeah good yeah bravo well found mate well found um ah, thank you so by more um should have a little look at by more um yeah sure which I, I must admit, I just started to have a little nose of it. It smells super. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, uh, well, wow. okay, so Bullmore, uh, I've got a few notes here. Excuse me. Um, I think really to appreciate, fully appreciate a single cask from a distillery, you must be aware of the fundamentals and the basic style its history and the character is the benchmark. Um, Bo Moore has its own specific character. You know, it's mid smoky, about 25 to 30 parts per million. Um, I mean, I've been lucky enough to try some, some of these fairs that I'm able to go to, uh, some Bo Moore from the, like the fifties and the sixties, you know, there's some, you know, legendary bottlings of Bowmore, you know, that, you know, acts as a, as I say, a benchmark to what perfection is. Um, you know, and then also there's a flip side of Bowmore as well in the, the mid to mid eighties, early nineties, they, mm. some people might have said that there's a, maybe a perfumey, uh, um, soapy kind of, Flavor yeah. to Bill Moore. Some people say this. <laughs> it smells uh, like of, it, it smells like the kind of lo the local Isla Women's Institute outing the old ladies with all the lavender perfume fell in the wash back or something. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I mean it's not for everybody, but some people obviously enjoyed it. But so there's the Bill Moore is by no means perfect, but it has been perfect in my opinion, uh, and I have been lucky enough to try. These bicentenary, bicentenaries and the um, yeah, amazing, all these things. So I had a, I've got quite a high benchmark with Bowmore, and I know what is possible. Um, this cask uh, is coming out of the end of the, you know, Jim McCune had just left. Uh, it, it, there was a lot of different things going on at Bowmore at this time, 2001, and this is at 55.6 percent. It's uh, you've got your you know, the saltiness, the, 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 the smokiness, really, really sweet. And I'm not saying that this is a fantastic 1966 Bowmore, but oh, forget about because it. I've gone. been lucky enough to try it, I've been lucky enough to try that stuff, I can see, uh, I can see that tropicalness, I can see the papaya, I can see the mangoes, I can, well, taste. It's, um, and I mean, obviously that is down in my opinion, Opinion, the fruitiness from Bowmore comes from uh, maybe slow distillation, which certainly happened back in the back in the fifties or sixties. Slow distillation, you know, you've got the stone floor maltings. Actually, the the water coming into the distilleries coming through peat bogs and the lot. And so, by the time they're distilling this slowly and putting it into good wood, that fruitiness over time turns into well tropical fruit, which is what many distillers these days are, t are trying to replicate yeah I, I love late 90s early 2000s um uh by more again there's, there's maybe not as much as we would like bottled independently and you know unfortunately they they, they 
don't bottle at 46 percent or unchill filtered or cast strength quite enough so you can't quite judge it um in the same way i think the bone wall 12 is very good you just wished it was a bit stronger and unchill filtered but um but i really love this i really really love this whiskey yeah again what, what same is what i thought with the longmorn um the bone more shines when it's in a one single cask it it's the cast strength it's the way and you don't need to mess about with a bone more you don't need to finish it so to speak like if i was there's a lot of finishing that we do we, we we might buy some 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 casks that are ready to bottle but they just don't have that little bit extra flavor profile maybe the color is so but bowmore is so legendary you just do not want to to touch it you know yeah. you want to bottle it as is if if you like that cask i i'm not i must admit i'm not getting quite as much of this truck tropical fruitiness that you're getting it's fruity but I, I can't compare it to that old 60s stuff but that just that's that stuff's pure filth um that yeah. but it is superb whiskey it's really yeah oh really i mean I'm a, I'm a, i must say i'm not saying that this is like the 50s or the 60s i'm going to be honest and it is what it is I, i'm getting yeah it, i'm getting kind of fruit bandage love yeah. more yeah, no, really good. I get fruit, bandages, kind of a bandages plaster kind of thing, like posh, fruity honey. Um, and there's something kind of stony on the on the palate as well that I, I, I like as well, like the smell of gravel or something, the taste, which sounds a bit weird, I must admit. But um, what else? Uh, yeah, kind of pink death. Oh, it's just lovely. It's really classic. But more, that's quite abrasive whiskies you found. I can't wait to get my hands on some bottles when they come in. Yeah, well, it'll be Friday. I'm coming to you. Um, yeah, th th this is part of series ten um, since 2016 till till now. Um, we've we release our whiskies in batches, as you know, Arthur. But uh, and this is our tenth batch. So right. we've. Uh, I really thought let's do something, and and you contacted me just at the kind of time where I was. I knew what it was going to be, but I was just like, oh delighted to get on your soapbox and, and chit chat about these these beauties um there's certainly some there's about six or seven casks that we've done and uh this is um two two of which the other ones are pretty fantastic as well I, i'd rather not chat about them too much but well briefly moment... because we, we should move on and get get someone else up to the plate but um I suppose a big part of North Star as well, with independent bottlers, you have something that kind of makes their name, something that, you know, they're not just bottling, you know, a, a series of distillers and lots of other, other independent bottlers um, bottle. And I, I, I would say with you guys, it was some of these amazing blended malts, aged blended malts that you did that really took mm. people um, or, or caught people's attention that you sold the very good prices vega and spiker or spicer i'm never quite sure how you say the names of your whiskies but um uh but that is um uh that's one element that has become kind of north star and just before this chat you reminded me that we'd signed up for an exclusive vega haven't we um yeah, it's good, coming yeah. as well so i forgot I had coming to buy on friday that. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. <laughs> Big adjustment to cash flow, but um, but looking forward to seeing yeah. it. And that is super small batch, isn't it? How many have we got? Forty bottles. Yeah, or something it's, coming? so Vega. The the the, Viga. the story Viga. with Vega was Vega. Yeah, is uh, it's all very well me releasing these wonderful bottling these wonderful single casks, but um, as most people know, they're they're becoming either harder to get or easy to get. They're just too expensive. Mm. So I can't, when, when I started about my second or third series, I really thought we should develop into another kind of brand that uh, it's a lot easier to source. High quality, a good age, and, uh, and a really good price, I think. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to celebrate all different categories of scotch. But Vega, I have gone with 400 bottles of each and 100% uh, sherry. Well, all of them have been sherry matured and at a great age. Uh, I'm really lucky with some supply that 
you know, I'm picking up a lot of really old blended malt that I can have fun with. And, mm -hmm. you know, I called this one Vega. Um, Vega being one of the brightest stars in the sky when, excuse me a minute, but when the axis of the world changes in about 10,000 years, uh, Vega will be our, our North Star. So I thought that was a good kind of, you know, and it looks quite fresh. It looks quite big. Um, with a fat bottle, you get a lot more real estate in the shelf. Um, smaller bottle, you kind of naturally get put to the front. It, uh, it, it just works for me. It's something that I know if I was to walk into a, a whiskey shop, I would certainly want to go over and read what is on that, it, you know, absorb the information. And, uh, you know, and hopefully with what space we have and information we give, people will... Um, We'll take that home and enjoy it. Um, cool. Well, I'm going to give you the help. I'm just going to say Karen Hughes, who says I've been pronouncing it wrong all this time. So have I. I've been told so many times, but I still go as Suzanne Vega every time. Um, Vega. But uh, thanks very much. You're in two cracking drums. Uh, good job, mate. And uh, now where are we going to go next? We'll go to Ben Nevis. Um, thanks for your time, Ian. Cheerio. Cheers. We'll bring you, you back at the end, mate. Um, so Ben Nevis, so we are dropping a bit in age. Um, we're bringing back Mr. Graham Mackay. Um, hi, Graham. Hello again. How are we doing? Um, yes, so, well. Uh, thank you. You've been adding lots of comments in the background there. Every time I looked at a comment screen, it's like the Matrix. Oh, so I'm, I'm double laptoping in here. I don't think you can probably see that. Uh, Right, yeah. good. Okay, cool. So we, we've got uh, the Ben Nevis, which I, I think is a really fun whiskey um, and uh, and also a really fun, fun distillery. Uh, so what, what do you like about Ben Nevis generally? Um, it's, it's stinky, you know, yeah. in, a, in a good way. It's, it's, not, um, it's not a whiskey for, for everyone, but I like how they've got a very defined style, very defined flavour profile. And, um, you know, it goes right down to... I always think they taste like the distillery looks, if that makes sense. You know, it's a bit of a <laughs> bit of an old shambles that, of a distillery. That's um, harsh. I in a good way. <laughs> in a good way, I should say. Uh, <laughs> but you know, it's it's not the most polished product. It's not the most um, well looked after distillery in terms of of building. But um, it's just been producing some really solid liquid for a very long time. Um, in fact, talking about a very long time, his because I, I was thinking, what a young Ben Nevis, you know, four year old Ben Nevis. I found this cool label. Well, I say I found this label. A, a dear friend who um, is watching tonight, Jim, uh, kindly lent it to me and I took a scan of it. So, well, the, the price is 42 shillings per dozen. So that tells you how long ago it was. Um, <laughs> but there they, they celebrate thoroughly uh, pure unblended Highland malt whiskey, thoroughly matured for five years in wood. So they're bragging about that five years. So this is Long John's, yeah, Long John's, which is the, the blend of Ben Nevis, Stuart Ben Nevis mm -hmm. um, also. Um, and I, I like this when in Scotland, see, climb and drink Ben Nevis. Um, yeah, that's cool. I like that. Yeah. So it must, be, it must be from, you know, the, the, the glory days of Scottish tourism and coming up and, and seeing all those things. But um, mm -hmm. anyway, so... Uh, yeah, it's a it's a young hooligan, this, isn't it? It is, yeah. You said that um, earlier, and I think that's a great way to, to describe it, you know. And for us, it's very crucial, and and we're not the only ones that do this, but we're we're always quite happy to bottle a whiskey when it's ready, you know. And, and Ian referred to that briefly with the Longmore, and he was saying these first full sherries can be ready quite quickly, so you need to keep revisiting them, and you need to keep. You know, you don't want them to get overbalanced. It's anyone can do an over matured whiskey that just tastes like splinters, you know. But the skill is is the balance there. Um, for me, I always like the fact that it's a conversation starter of a whiskey. You know, Carnmore since since day one have done three, four, or five, six, seven years. Um, that's a nice comment there. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think. You know, you and I know, and many people know that it, realistically, a lot of the non-age statements out there will be I, five, six, seven years old. I can see that message is confusing you. You think you may be talking to yourself here? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't into the void, but it's it's speaking back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Um, and, and also, I've not finished my Ben Nevis, so I'm thoroughly confused. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, you know, I think it's it's all about showing people the transparency, and, and Ian touched on it as well. I think it's a, a good way that indie bottlers kind of proceed nowadays, and, and we're quite happy to, to tell people it, it can be good at 27 years, like the canvas, it can be good at four years old, um, and give it a try and, and see what you think, you know. But it's a big chunky distillate as well and and you might expect that it needs to be softened a little bit more i see phil thompson piping in there with a little uh comment about me sleeping on his floor that was a long time ago <laughs> we've come on a long way since then i hope so <laughs> <laughs> um but you know i think um and we should make very clear to people because it doesn't say so on the label they will have discovered it now that it's a peated Ben Evis, peated and cherried, and obviously not all Ben Evis is peated. So um, at the younger age, it should theoretically have more peat coming through than if it was aged for a longer time. The sherry should hopefully have helped kind of round that off. And, and personally, I often think that smoky whiskey, it can help to mask the youth of, of, of whiskey a little bit. So you can maybe get away with it at a, bit of a younger age too. Um, but yeah, for me, it's just got a lot going on. You know, we can get into all the tasting notes we want to, but the really key tasting note is, is it good? You know, and, and I think it is good. Um, I'm, I'm very happy with it. Yeah, it's a little wild. It's a little bonkers. It is youthful, but fun. You know, it's a, it's a kind of tear away. It's kind of got this kind of, like, it's, there's fruit there. that You'd expect the Ben Nevis, that brewery yeah. thing, one would assume. Um like tin fruit cocktail, but kind of also a bit diesely almost, or doughy bread, or that kind of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I went down the kind of forest floor route and farmhousey and leathery. You know, it's mm. um, if you rolled a hay bale and covered it in leather, you know that that kind of thing. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I see that too. And actually, I just said um, lechegi, ledegi. You know, mm. like it reminds me very much of that funkiness that you get from from lechig as well. Yeah, it can be pretty farmy, can't it? Um, absolutely. Uh, interesting comment from uh, Luke Skipper there, oft sent to Japan for finishing school. So it feels like Ben Nevis has change about to come. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's, it does. I think um, a lot of us in the industry are a little bit nervous <laughs> about this, aren't we? And, and, you know, it's worth talking about that Japan for finishing school. So, so Ben Nevis is owned by Nika, which is, obviously a large Japanese concern and and famously Masataka Takatsuru with the, the coolest name in the industry um, <laughs> has got the tie-in with Scotland and uh, you know we won't go down that rabbit hole too much but Japanese whiskey is clearly very popular it's having its moment in the limelight but I think a lot of uh, consumers maybe don't realize perhaps the slightly less regulated nature of it and, and it's not to say that's good or bad it's, it's just different to scotch and so a lot of um japanese whiskey will be destined oh sorry scotch whiskey will be destined for japan and, and in particular ben nevis and actually i'm pretty sure i've got it written here we do ship a lot of bulk to japan yeah so i, I read that between 2013 and 2018 there was a 750 percent increase in the, in the shipment of bulk grain um, from Scotland to Japan, so that's not all getting labelled as Scottish green whiskey, I don't think. So it does yeah. show that the demand has gone through the roof in, in the meantime. Yeah, but it's, it's I suppose fans of independent bottling are slightly worried about. There's been this sweet spot; these amazing Ben Nevises that have come out at um, uh, affordable prices. Um, yeah, Thompson Brothers have done some great ones, which we did one exclusively ourselves with Dave Broom for his film. Mm -hmm. Um, oh yeah, amber light. Yeah, um, sorry, the amber light. Um, and uh, but um, and I'm just slightly worried they see the value and that maybe it's going to be rebranded and prices are going to go up. But there's a they're a paranoid bunch, aren't they? Whiskey fans, yeah, whiskey we all are. You know. and whiskey bottlers, we're all it's a competition seeking those paranoid. We're, yeah, we're, you know, I, sorry, I, I was just going to say quickly. I I often think it's like um, you know supporting your favourite band. And um, yeah. it's the same with whiskey distilleries. You kind of want to keep them to yourselves. And once they start to get too much recognition, you start to get a bit worried that the brand owner might be like, 
yeah, we could make some more money out of this. And, and you know, Colin Roth was obviously the famous, um, well-regarded managing director there for a very long time. And I think, as far as I know, he was left to do his own thing and to really just consistently produce the same quality of liquid with a good wood policy, which is what anyone would hope a distillery would do. But in reality, I guess it's not as simple as that. So mm -hmm. yeah, we shall we shall see what happens in the future. But uh, briefly, before we move on, because you piqued my interest, and I don't quite know what it's all about. But you said <laughs> you said, could I talk about a Ben Nevis Distillery TripAdvisor review? And then this afternoon, you sent it over. I had a quick read. Still, the quite the, don't know what it's about. But hang on, let's uh, let's get that up, and you can, oh, you can explain to me. Hang on, I'll just get rid of this comment. There we go. That's the way. Okay, Sorry, so so yeah, absolutely yeah. disgusted. Review of Ben Nevis Distillery. You spineless pack of wolves. A woman on the show hunted stood to win fifty thousand pounds. I vaguely heard of hunted. You'll have to explain it to me. A sum she planned to use for her disabled mum's treatment at Starfleet Distillery, grasped her in for a meagre £500, lowest of the low, will not be purchasing any of their liquids. Po probably tastes like betrayal. <laughs> Zero out of ten. Would I not like recommend. It. Tell me, I, what, what the hell? You know, it, it was simply <laughs> one of these things when you're you're doing a tasting. Um, I, I did this at a tasting a few months ago and I was doing my, my research and up came on Google, Ben Nevis, absolutely disgusted. And I thought, oh, what do we have here? And so, yeah, I think it turns out Hunted is, is that show from Channel 4 where people have to outrun the um, the surveillance community and the cops and things for a prize. And, uh, yeah, it turns out this this poor woman went, who was one of the contestants, turned up at the distillery, asked for some help. It's all, I've done a bit of further research um and one of the tour guides was caught on camera saying yeah we'll not dob you in we'll just go up this road you know and and you'll you'll be fine you can hide up there and then immediately he phones up the hotline and says you know she's up there for his, his 500 quid so so austin c was not so happy with that and um i think it's the best tasting note that's that's been said tonight you know betrayal in a glass <laughs> yeah Lowest of the low, the worst kind of scum, Ben Nevis. But <laughs> <laughs> no, they made lovely whiskey, and Colin was it was a, is a lovely man. But um, uh, and and they've done such a good job for a long time. And I hope uh, I hope nothing, well, not too much changes in the near future. Yeah, uh, uh, r really fun dram, and, and good for you for having the bravery to 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 bottle it because it looked weird on paper. It, it is does. weird. It, it is weird in the glass, but it's yeah. great fun. I really really like it. It should be weird, I think. You know, I, I wouldn't want to do a, a really approachable Ben Nevis or we would have done some reverse alchemy there and taken no. away the character of the spirit. So, no, you, so, can't, yeah. you, you can't approach Ben Nevis. It will just stab you in the back. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> right, cool. Well, uh, so we're on, the, we're on the home straight now. We've got... Um, We've got Whiskey Road. Thanks very much, uh, Graham. Uh, that was great. Um, and then we've got uh, Whiskey Road, and uh, I'll bring Greg in. Um, so our first blended malt of the evening. Um, hi, Greg. How you doing? Not too bad. I'm slightly holding it together after all those high APV drams there. But yeah, yeah. unenviable yeah. task to go last. No one wants to go last, but um, no. <laughs> I really wanted to include. I had I had tried this before when you first released it. I really want, wanted to include it because it's it's a really good, affordable, just high quality PT whiskey that um, that you put together. And uh, this isn't sourced. You you've blended it yourself, is that right? Yeah, so the, the Whiskey Vaux range was um, a project that's been a long time in the works, but yeah, just released recently as a trilogy. Um, so we've got three different expressions, which is it's a really good way to showcase whiskey to newcomers. And it's also got familiar kind of uh, channels to go down for people who are in whiskies, into whiskey. So you've got your, your smooth and sweet, which is probably leaning towards what people who are new to whiskey think whiskey tastes like. And then at the either kind of end, we've got a, a heavily sherried influence one, which is our um, rich and spicy. And then we've got our smoke and peat at the other side. So it's a good journey to kind of try the three as a trilogy, but yeah, if you're familiar with your what flavor profile you like, it's easy for you to select which one would be your favorite. I would imagine just from the the, the names that were given. Uh, cool. And you're not going to tell us what's in it, are you? 
It's the most common question, and I think anybody who does a blended malt, and uh, you'll get the same answer from everyone. It's just, it's almost like asking Colonel Sanders for his eleven herbs and spices. No one's going to give up um, the the full profile there for you. But yeah, it's the, I, I've always been drawn to things like this with um, blended malts, and people like Compass Box have done it in the past as well. I, I like the the mystery of these kind of drams as well. Even just to sit down if you're if you're new to whiskey or if you're well established, it's it's good to test yourself and and try these kind of. Um, I'm putting my neck on the line here, but um, okay. And you can just look scared if I get it right, but um, the uh, this smells like Diageo whiskey. It's really good Diageo whiskey on the PT ones, and is it a mix of Isla and Island? Is it? Yeah, so it's um, it's a uh, you you've nailed it there. It's a mix of Isla and Island. That's as far as I'll be able to go with no, that. I, but I, yeah. I, knew, I, knew, I yeah. knew that bit. I knew that bit. But um, <laughs> it, it seems to me like it's got that Kalila, Lagavulin, even heat from Tarasca or something like that. It just feels some Diageo, obviously, they make lots of great whiskey, and that just feels like some Diageo stock. But anyway, you, you've got a good poker face. You won't be drawn. Yeah. Let's carry on talking about something else. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> um, Whiskey Row, uh, this yep. the name uh, comes from Lease and its distilling history, um, which is rich, um, obviously. Um, and uh, yeah, t- tell us about that. Where, where was Whiskey Row? So it's an often a uh, forgotten thing that Edinburgh and Leith, because they were obviously separate going back in time there, um, played an instrumental, instrumental part in, in whiskey, a distribution blend and bottling. Um, lots of uh, famous names in the industry started off uh, treading the streets in Edinburgh and Leith. And yeah, it, it just goes to show that there's actually three areas in Edinburgh that have been known locally or um, uh, on maps as Whiskey Row. So you've got down in the Cowgate, there was an area down there that was referred to as, as Whiskey Row by the locals. Um, and then you had the, the um, Royal Terrace, which overlooks London Road and right out into the Forth. There was a lot of merchants had houses along there and the locals referred to that. As whiskey row, and then obviously the one that we are we are aligning ourselves with is the one down in Leith, which is modern day Elf Street. Um, a lot of the the kind of bottling and bonded warehouses and stuff was done down in that neck of the woods um, for ease to to get along the road to the distribution channels that the port provided. So yeah, it's just kind of showcasing that almost forgotten history that Edinburgh has with with whiskey, and it's certainly it's it's coming more to the fore. At the moment, there's, there's more brands and support to, uh, pushing Edinburgh back into the whiskey scene. But yeah, when you when you start delving back, there's a real kind of rich history uh, of whiskey in the area. Yeah, I absolutely, I absolutely um, love the whiskey history of Leeds. And I came to Edinburgh as a student back in 1995 or something like that. And you know, Leeds had this kind of reputation of being a rough place and a um, well, downtrodden, or you know, you need to watch yourself. Certainly, with a posh English accent like me, um, <laughs> but it was kind of it was it was more than that. It was it was a successful place. It was a place of merchants. It was a place of business. It was a place of commerce. And I, I've uh, again, my, my dear friend Jim and Linda, that they, they've um, lent us some um, cool postcards to kind of show this. That's the yep. Kirk Gate in Leith. Which, if anyone knows now, has got like a farm food, farm foods, a betting shop, and some en- empty lots. It's this terribly ugly fifties, sixties um, uh, shopping precinct. Um, but just just look at those lovely, lovely shops. And of course, you know you've got these amazing ships that would have been coming in. This is right on the shore, um, and it would have been a thriving, bustling place. This is Bernard Street. Um, this is lease from Ferry Road. I mean, it, it, it was a successful place, and okay, it's coming back up now. Uh, you know, there's a lot of Airbnb and a lot of investment in property and things like that. But there's also distilling happening again, and you just think of all these distilleries that were down there. Um, that's the th- foot of the walk. So if you've been through Edinburgh, you've probably been through there. Um, wasn't just the distilleries. I'll pu- put up that one of. Um, uh, Leith Distillery there again. Um, it would have been all the ancillary services that went with that, box makers, um, uh, glassworks, of course, there was the glassworks down in Leith, uh, um, pottery manufacturers, um, and just look at, and then, of course, the Leith Depot, look at that station there. Um, just look how much friends going in and out of there. 
um, what a successful place of commerce it was. I'm sure there would have been some rough and ready, uh, you know, sailor style drinking going on there, but it was, <laughs> it was so much more than that. Uh, this is there still is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there, there, there still is, but there's more than that. It's probably a bit um, small uh, to read here, but it's one of those lovely things with um, all those recommendations, wholesome and pleasant. Um, yeah. Uh, exceptionally pure and a safe stimulant. And lots of this chat about fusel oils in those days and impurities. Oh, there we go. Yeah, great. That's it there, yeah. Oh, amazing. So that's yeah. Encore Whiskey. So Leith Distillery had their blend Encore Whiskey. And um, I think this actually came through our auction, didn't it? <laughs> it did, yes. It was, it was procured through the, the wonderful uh, Royal Mile Whiskey's auction. So, yes, as you say, it's got... Um, recommendations from local doctors and medical journals and everything on it it's just crazy to think that that was <laughs> that was allowed back in the day but yeah we could we could all do with uh, our local doctors putting prescriptions of whiskey out at the moment i think yeah yeah it's thoroughly th free from all injurious substance uh, there's lots of discussion <laughs> about that fusel oils and things like that which yeah. i think the fusel oils thing was almost like the old equivalent of um saying you'd had a bad pint I've had this whiskey with too much fusel oil. Um, no one seems bothered about fusel oil. But I think it's probably a good time to bring in our special guest of the evening. Dave, have you ever had a bad pint? <laughs> uh, hey, uh, I, I've, had, I've had plenty of bad pints, yeah. Yeah, it's a good I, I excuse, remember, I remember uh, being given a, a very bad pint in a certain pub in Isla uh, the night after we complained about the quality of the food there. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yes yes yeah fusel oils yeah dreadful things dreadful dreadful things yeah. so um so thanks for coming on dave you are a mystery hey, guest no, it, it, it's an absolute treat it, it's been lovely to to lurk uh and and just sit here and try drams it's good yeah and we thought, as a as special guest, you could be our summer-upper of the drams because you've been quietly tasting them away in the background. Oh, you, um, you never told me that. Uh, no, I just <laughs> no, no, uh, no you, you, you sent me through the, the list of drams and I, look, I automatically just began doing it. I began rubbing my hands with glee because Linkwood, jeez, you know, you know, if people ask me what my favourite whiskies are, uh, I will always have liquid in there because I, I just think it's a sensational, sensational whiskey that is overlooked and perhaps misunderstood. It's one of these slightly more delicate uh, perfumed whiskies that I think a lot of people just maybe don't pay a lot of attention to because they want to go for big and it's heavy and it's peaty and it's heavily sherry and it's boom, you know, it's in your face. And something as subtle and beautiful and balanced as, as Linkwood uh, can quite often get overlooked. That was an absolute killer of a Linkwood. The port wasn't too obtrusive. I've got a bit of problem with port casks if they get a bit too pinky. Uh, but yeah, I, I thought it had Linkwood character and, and it was utterly gorgeous. Yeah, great. The canvas, uh, and, and basically I, I just want to uh come up to your house and have a look through that that ledger wearing white gloves uh the canvas is glorious uh i i i, I did this weird tasting uh, a few years back it was, it was it was it was vaguely weird it was a rum show and i was to do a tasting on the links between scotland and the caribbean and whiskey and rum etc etc and I put in a Douglas Lane uh, Port and Das, uh, and the, the audience were all rum, rum lovers and rum distillers. Uh, and I gave them this glass, and they all went, yeah, what's this rum? And I went, it's whiskey. And they go, no, it's rum. Uh, and we had this big kind of fun barney. And I do get a lot of rummy notes uh, coming off uh Grain whiskies, especially old grain whiskies. Uh, oh, whiskies. I agree. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I think it's got that. And I tend to find more rum notes than uh, bourbon notes or, or or sherry notes. And this for me, what had that? I think that sherry cast just gave that slight kind of funkiness that mm -hmm. kind of reminded me slightly of a of a Jamaican rum, like not quite Hamden, but more kind of Worthy Park. 
Uh, so it had that wonderful, slightly decaying banana uh, character uh, coming through. I, I thought it was just great. You know, it, it wasn't. It wasn't just this, and that's what I love about Green. It's not this kind of neutral spirit. It's not this kind of clean neutral spirit. It's got every distillery had a character, and if you talk to the guys who are still working in Diageo, who started their lives in gin, uh, gin sorry, in in uh, Green distilleries. They'll talk about what the difference was between Cambus and Carsbridge and North British and Port Dundas and Cali. And all of them have or had their own individual distillery character. And all the green distilleries which are still operating now still have their own distillery character. You know, Govern is very, very different to Inver Gordon, is very, very different to Cameron Bridge. Uh, and I love the fact that, that, that green whiskey is coming back. So uh, that, that was a belter. Uh, Longmorn, again, another rub hands of glee. Uh, that was a killer, an absolute killer. Yeah, I get the flat coke. You know, I, I'd, I'd written down flat coke, tomato puree, you know, all these kind of weird things. Um, <laughs> <go on. laughs> with, 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 with really interesting sherry whiskies. But you need a whiskey with a good deal of guts to be able to cope with that assault that you're going to be getting from a first fill sherry cask. And it did it admirably. Yeah, you, yeah, it was squeaked out at exactly, that was a very Scottish term, it was squeaked out exactly <laughs> at, at, at the right time, uh, just before the cask began to dominate. So you've still got that kind of richness and fruitiness coming from the, the long morn. Beautiful. I beautiful. must admit, I thought it was on the edge as well, actually. Really yeah. for something so so young, almost getting yeah. slightly yeah, yeah, getting slightly yeah. extracted almost. But. Yeah, uh, but there was just enough. You know, I, I'm not I'm not a huge fan of over extracted whiskies. I want balance. I want distillery character to come through because it's quite easy to shove any new spirit into a brand new cask and then you know slap a distillery name on it, but you can't tell where it's come from. Uh, but that that, that was that was a cracking uh, long morn. Uh, what's next? Uh, Bomore, yeah, the Bomore. God, what a revelation! Uh, on the nose, uh, it was you see, the thing about Bomore is you never quite know what you're going to get. You know, some are some have got no smoke, and some have got saltiness, some have got actually quite a lot of smoke. And it was all this kind of real, I won't even go into the, the, the perfume bit, uh, although it's all to do with tomatoes and swimming pools. Uh, and, and it's you know, it's you can't really tell where you are with Bomore. And on the nose, it, there was smoke, there was salt in it. There was that kind of floral thing coming through. And then taste, I, I disagree with you for the first time in my life. Uh, I did get the tropical fruit. You know, I really got, I really got that kind of mango, uh, papaya, super ripe tinned peaches. Very Scottish thing. Uh, yeah, I, I thought it was utterly delicious. It was an absolute beauty. The Ben Nevis was filth in a glass. Uh, <laughs> I, which, which again is a good thing. Uh, I, I, I actually typed something in to you. You know, it's kind of reminded me of kind of rendered pork fat. You know, <laughs> pork. Yeah. I, but but not. And and the, the thing that I love about Ben Nevis is that they stay just. They, they push it right to the line, but they don't tip it over into horrible you know, really overused oil that you get off, you know, you know, a, a street a street burger van kind of thing, mm. which you can get when things begin to move into faintiness. It's always just before it tips over into bad. And it's that beautiful line that you know you want in you want in music, you know, uh really, you know, you want just that little bit of danger. <laughs> but just right, just the right edge of it. Yeah, I, I thought it was filthy, but but rather wonderful. Good. And uh, and the final uh, the final one I, I thought was just utterly approachable, beautiful. I knocked it down with a huge amount of water actually, just to see how how it came out because I thought that for me that's not a whiskey to sit and sip, you know, you know, and be intellectual about. That's one for a highball. Uh, that's one to extend to to. You know, serve with friends to serve at different temperatures, and it really comes through uh, when you add uh, a lot of water. The character is still there. There's enough sweetness. Uh, I described a lot of these young smoky whiskies uh, recently as being like uh, 
kind of pale faced young hooligans with, with kind of switch blades in, in, in their hands, you know, they're <laughs> too aggressive, you know, eh, you know, they're coming at you, I'm smoky, you know. Uh, and Bright, this Bright, just, Brighton Rock, like where you're from, I guess. That's yeah, that, yeah, that. just like, <laughs> like Pinky, uh, Pinky and Brighton rather than Pinky and Isla, uh, you know, with, with chip in the hand. Uh, but this didn't have that. This had that really lovely sweetness at, at the heart of it, which acts as balance. So, yeah, yeah, what a lineup. Good. Yeah, good. Oh, I'm delighted. So, um, well, I, we've got some things to talk about next tasting project. But Ooh, I yes. think rather, that rather than um, we, we should let the other guys go. Um, so, what I'm going to do, the other three that are now doing the lurking job, as we say goodbye, you've just got to tell us what your favorite whiskey was that wasn't your own whiskey. So, we'll start with Graham. Favorite whiskey that wasn't your own whiskey? It's got to be the long one. Got to be the long one. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Full on, chunky. Yeah. Didn't hold back. Loved it. Great. Thanks very much for coming along, Graham, and sharing your whiskey. It's really good yeah, to see thanks, you. Thanks, Graham. Cheers. 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 Right. Now we're going to Greg. Greg. Hello. Hiya. Hi. What was your favorite whiskey that yeah. wasn't your own whiskey? I'd have to agree, the, the long morning as well. It was, yeah, right up my street. Absolutely. Good. Thanks so much. And uh, well done on some cracking whiskeys. The whiskey row. Thank you. Go. The whiskey row, I thought, showed so well. Um, thanks, mate. And see you soon. Thanks, guys. Thanks. See Cheers. you soon. Right. Ian, you're still with us, man. Favorite yes, whiskey that wasn't the, favorite whiskey that wasn't the long one. <laughs> uh, the Lightwood for sure. That was uh, oh, okay. fantastic. Just uh, reminds me of yeah, ah, just whiskey to me is a time machine, and that brought uh, a lot of fantastic memories back. So thank you, thank you very Great. much. Great. Well, thank you for bottling these whiskeys. Thank you for sharing them with us. And sounds like I'll see you on Friday. Friday, yes. Have the kettle on. Yes, I will. I will. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers, Bye. mate. Cheerio. For the record, mine was a bone more. I just loved that bone more so yeah, much. And I did think it had tropical things. It just when Ian was talking about 60s bone more, I was like, hang on a yeah. minute. <laughs> it was quite like how there was still enough of that, that, that smoke in there just to not, but you know, you, you keep that in cask for another. 10 20 years it would have turned into that and the interesting thing about Bomore is that uh that is the style that they're trying to get back to you know using uh very clear wort uh playing around with yeast long relaxed fermentation long distillation uh that is what what, what they're aiming to be producing as the distillery character uh these days so which is great news yeah i think they're making, making some great stuff so um I'll put up the list of the drowns with prices uh, in just a moment and then we'll say goodbye and then everything will be available for sale online if people want to buy anything, but that's not entirely the point of doing these things. It's just to share some drowns and see some faces. Um, but first, I wanted to talk about the next couple of tastings. I mm -hmm. will, Dave, mention uh, the Somerset Cider and Brandy one that we're doing. So this is a bit of a departure, but... Um, uh, I am a big fan of uh, the Somerset Cider Brandy Company, um, an amazing uh, family um, who, well, Julian started a distillery, in, a craft distillery in 1987, making cider brandy, which wasn't even a category, a category that he had to fight for, and made cider as well when everyone else was ripping up uh, cider orchards. So he's a, a real maverick, a real character. And um, his daughter, who's now very much uh, an active part of the business, Matilda, extremely interesting as well, um, and starting to make her mark on, on what they're doing. So we're going to have, you're going to taste cider, five-year-old brandy, 10-year-old brandy, uh, the aperitif, and also a single cask, um, single cask, three-year-old brandy that's been matured fully in ice cider casks, which is unbelievable. It's like apple, 3D apple, basically, in a glass. It's really, really cool. No, I don't think anyone's done this before. Um, and, yeah, so it's tremendously exciting and, and some very entertaining people as well. So um, looking forward um, to doing that. Um, and I think, yeah, the packs are just gone on sale at the start of this tasting along with the amber light ones that we're just about to talk about again like these ones limited packs it was delighted 
I was delighted that everyone bought these ones so quickly. And um, yeah, please uh, hop on board if you want to um, learn about cider brandy. Then we also have the Amber Light Director's Half Cut, which, Dave, could you explain, please, um, what we've got going on here? Yeah, uh, yeah, and, and first of all, thank you so much for agreeing to be part of this. A uh, couple of years back, uh, my friend Adam Park and I made a movie. <clears throat> He's a film director, so he did all the hard work. I wrote and ponced about Scotland. Uh, and the the idea behind the film was to look at the way that whiskey has influenced Scottish culture and Scottish culture has influenced whiskey. So rather than being yet another fantastic film about how whiskey is made, it was about what whiskey means to the the country and how it has influenced the country and how it how it's rippled out uh, across society and, and art and literature and music over hundreds of years. Uh, and it seemed to work, and and you know we got some great people. We do whiskey. Uh, whiskey production within about 30 seconds. We filmed at one distillery because the guy who made the whiskey there, Francis Cuthbert, was the person we wanted to talk to rather than about production. We speak to Ian Rankin, speak to uh, one of Alistair Gray's last last interviews, uh, Lord Elgin, uh, a whole bunch of musicians who are playing music as well. And yeah, I, I, and people seem to like it. Uh, it won, won a big award uh, this year, a few weeks ago. Uh, and finally, finally, uh, people are going to be able to see it online. Uh, so the 25th of this month at 8 o'clock, it will uh, be emerging on Vimeo uh, pay-per-view. And uh, we've linked up with you guys uh, to do the director's half-cut. Uh, and the director's half-cut idea is a bit like, you know, in DVDs where you have the director's commentary, you know, the experts and kind of uh, babble uh, about the film all over it. So Ado and I are going to be babbling about the film uh, and drinking some whiskies at appropriate moments. Uh, so by buying a pack, you get uh, the whiskies, you get code to the film so you can watch the film, and you can also listen to us uh, at the same time. If you get a bit bored with us, it doesn't matter because you've still got the whiskeys and you can still see the film. Uh, so, so it's great. You know, it's, it's kind of a win-win situation. Uh, what else do you need to know? How it works. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> you say linking up with us. You, you're, you're sharing our platform. I'm introducing yeah. you and then I'm walking away and letting you guys get on with it. Because, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's but, but, so, <laughs> you, you're welcome. Yeah. And we are fulfilling the distribution of the packs. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, basically, what you need to do is have two screens. So your biggest screen, whether that's your laptop or smart TV, you can uh, stream the, the film on that. And then on another screen, whether it's an iPad or maybe another laptop or a phone, uh, you can listen to the commentary. And then thanks to thanks to uh, your platform, uh, can then ask us questions. So there's going to be a Q and A afterwards. So uh, as I said, you know, you can listen to the commentary all the way through. You can uh, watch the film uh, and ask questions, and then we'll do a Q and A at the end of it. It's it's the best way to watch it. It's the only way that, that we can kind of get the film out at, at this uh, slightly awkward time because uh, because we had some great screenings uh, planned. Uh, we were actually going to be in Campbellton, uh, the amazing, amazing Art Deco Cinema in Campbellton uh, at the same time as the Campbellton Festival. We were going to be doing some stuff like an Isla. Uh, so there was a whole bunch of different kind of whiskey related uh, events we were going to do, but obviously Corona ha has kind of put the kibosh on that. But uh, but yeah, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. It's going to be good fun. Yeah, great. Well, we buy yeah. the packs, watch the film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're del delighted to be involved, and uh, thank you again for oh, coming along this evening. Uh, last couple of comments coming through. Um, uh, no, that's about us done there, I think. So I just need to say goodbye, Dave. It's good to see you, mate. Bye, Arthur. Yeah, thank you very much. It's really insightful uh, sum up of the drums. And um, no, thank you. No, no, thank you. The, and thanks to all the guys for for bottling these. You know, the independent sector has to be has to be supported, whether it's bottlers or retailers or, or bookshops or, or whatever. Uh, yeah, fantastic drums. Great. See you at the end of the month. Yeah, look forward okay. to it.
Cheerio, Dave. I'll, I'll Cheerio, uh, make you leave now. Um, so that's the end of the tasting. I had a great time. I've lots of really nice guys there and uh, lots of good chat. Uh, as promised, because uh, people always ask, those are the prices of the various whiskies, uh, all 70 CL. Um, I'm going to end this broadcast now. Uh, just a, a few thank yous, actually, to uh, um, Jed, who did lots of preparation um, for this tasting. Um, all these lovely slides and things. Uh, the guys in the warehouse who, who are working very hard in difficult situations, it is hard at the moment in terms of the, the, the current ways of working. Uh, Jim and Linda Brown for um, kindly lending so many of these lovely artefacts that we've been able to put up. Um, uh, all you guys for watching and all the guys for supplying whiskey. So those are prices um, and uh, cheerio. Hope to see you for the next one. Bye-bye.